So this is on reinvigorating um, nuclear disarmament. And, I'm real, and we're really honored to have someone who is probably one of the best authorities on India's role in nuclear disarmament, and someone who's occupied not just the national discourse space, but also internationally. Um, someone who's as self-effacing as he's knowledgeable, like Sujata Mehta in the previous. Uh, you will never uh, see Ambassador Shilkan Sharma projecting all that he knows, and he knows a great, great deal. Um, Ambassador uh, Shilkan Sharma is a senior Indian diplomat, and please bear with me while I read through his bio profile, because um, it, is, it really tells you the range of expertise that he brings to the table. Uh, he served as India's ambassador to the International Atomic Energy Agency one of those agencies that India has been trying to woo for so long. And as a member of IAEA's Board of Governors, which is again very rare for an Indian to have occupied it, for three decades he was uninterruptedly associated with studies on disarmament, security and cooperation, and strategic weapons development in various capacities <coughs> as scholar, diplomat, international civil servant. Joint Secretary and Additional Secretary at the Ministry of External Affairs and as Ambassador and Secretary General of SARC. He held the positions of Distinguished Fellow at the Center for Air Power Studies, where some of our uh, earlier contributors to this volume were affiliated with. Ambassador Sharma served as First Secretary, Disarmament, Permanent Mission of India, Geneva, and Alternative Representative of India to the UN Conference on Disarmament from 83 to 86, he was a director, United Nations Division and Disarmament Head, MEA, 89 to 91. He was Joint Secretary, South End Disarmament, MEA, in charge of India's relations with ASEAN, Indochina, then Indochina and South Pacific, and Ambassador of India to Austria, Permanent Representative of India to all international organizations in Vienna, during 1994 to 2000, he was associated with the IAEA as a senior professional in external relations and policy coordination division. And in 2000, he returned to the MEA as joint secretary, disarmament, and inter international security affairs. <clears throat> he has a master's of science degree, unlike most of us here who are social scientists, in nuclear physics from Bombay University and a PhD in high energy physics from the Indian Institute of Technology. So obviously knows very well, not just the vocabulary, but all, all, the, all the syntax that is associated with high-end uh, weapons. And he received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from IIT Mumbai in 2007 for his contributions to non-proliferation and nuclear policy. So we really couldn't have had a better person to chair this session. And this session is really, uh, it, 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 it comprises some outstanding young women scholars who have been working in this field. We have R Dr. Rashmi Kazi, who's going to speak on the future of nuclear verification. And we've said that it is a space that more women should enter. And I think you, you have entered that space very decisively and uh, you, uh, Rashmi is professor at the Nelson Mandela Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution at Jamia Millia Islamia where she previously served as associate professor and she was associate fellow at the IDSA where she led projects on themes spanning challenges and opportunities for global nuclear security, nuclear terrorism and nuclear disarmament. And it's a, it's a longish bio data, but she, her doctoral thesis was on the evolution of India's nuclear doctrine. She's also worked on nuclear terrorism and the UN Resolution 1540 from a South Asian perspective. And her publications include many monographs, and she's an alumnus of the National Defense University's Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies, Washington, D.C., and a visiting fellow for the South Asia program at the Stimson Center. So such, an, uh, such a wide sort of set of affiliations. 
and I think you are going to speak on, as I said, new, the future of nuclear verifications. She's be followed by Dr. Kanika Rakra, who's also a contributor to this volume. <coughs> it's called Nuclear Risk Reduction and Disarmament. And she will draw on recent initiatives for nuclear risk reduction, which has been a topic around the table, and lessons from regional and international success stories. Uh, it's good to hear some success stories, Kanika, and you're well positioned to, to share those with us. Uh, and I will just go quickly through your bio data, since you are also a host to this event. Uh, she's consultant at RSIS and affiliated with the G20 <coughs> program, which has kept her so very busy, uh, a former fellow at Middlebury Institute for International Studies at the Swedish South Asian Studies Network and the Harvard-led Arms Control Negotiation Academy. She holds a PhD from the Center of International Politics and Organization and Disarmament, CPOD, from JNU, <coughs> where she was an ICSSR doctoral fellow. Prior to that, at, uh, prior to her position at RIS, Dr. Work Rakra was working with the Policy Planning and Research Division and Disarmament and Inter International Security Affairs Division of the Indian Ministry of External Affairs. So she brings a great deal of expertise again to the table. After that, we will have Smita, Smita Singh, and her title is, of course, India and the WPS Agenda. And the presentation will foreground India's implementation of the WPS Agenda, although India is not a signatory yet to the WPS, and how CEDAW itself is invoked in many of its, its extension uh, of the WPS activities, and speak on the four pillars of the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, enshrined in 1325. And after Smita, we're very privileged to have expert comments from, Dr. Uh, from Air Marshal Rajesh Kumar. We're deeply grateful, sir, for your time. He's a former Commander-in-Chief Strategic Forces Command in the Indian Air Force. He was commissioned into the flying branch of the Air Force as a fighter pilot in 1982 and has commanded a fighter aircraft squadron <coughs> and a frontline air base. Some of Air Marshal Kumar's appointments include Director Operations at the Air Headquarters in Delhi, Team Leader of the Project Monitoring Team for Airborne Early Warning and Control System. We're all always talking about AWACS, but we all know <coughs> very little about them. And so we are very grateful for your uh, presence here. He's the director of the Indian Air Force Project Management Team at the Aeronautical Development Agency in Bangalore, Senior Air Staff Officer of Eastern Air Command in Shillong, and several other. He's, of course, received the Param Vishish Seva Medal and the Ati Vishish Seva Medal and the Vayu Sena Medal for Gallantry. And he is a graduate of the Mayo College, Ajmer. Ajmer happens to be one of my favorite cities and alumnus of the National Defense Academy. So as you can see, we have an extremely, shall I say, exciting panel. Uh, and uh, Professor uh, uh, Ambassador Shilkan Sharma, may I request you to make some opening remarks and then chair this session. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, actually, I uh, was feeling a little uh, uh, uncomfortable with them. Uh, and thank you for doing the introductions, which uh, uh, saved me the, the time for speaking my mind about uh, the issues before us. Um, you know, I uh, feel that uh, this session seems to be uh, looking at, uh, you know, how the uh, rubber hits the road, f for that matter, you know, because the uh, when you talk of disarmament, what actually it will mean? So, what Reshmikazi and uh, what uh, Kanika Rakra and Smita are talking are concrete stuff uh, relevant to disarmament, uh, if at all, whenever it comes through. And uh, uh, Air Marshal Rajesh Kumar, your comments will be coming from the depth of experience uh, about these things. Now, how to reinvigorate nuclear disarmament is a hard question, no doubt. But uh, as the French say, when it is complicated, keep it simple. Past seven, eight decades have been through the steps needed so many times, and there is no dust of relevant ideas, initiatives, and proposals. Unfortunately, these are almost entirely addressing governments, 
and that too for the large part governments of nuclear weapon states. Interest of these governments in nuclear disarmament, as the morning session has clearly shown, this interest has diminished a great deal in recent decades. But so has the interest of people also in all continents in disarmament. As though they have learned to live with the anomie about nuclear disarmament. What's the reason? First was they felt that the threat essentially went away in 1991 by Soviet demise. Even though tens of thousands of nukes survived. And all that remained in their view to do was to strengthen the non-proliferation regime. Second, both these assumptions are invalidated today <coughs> by, as this was borne out in the morning, by what has happened in Ukraine. But a familiar complexity is unfolding, which is that even though the complacence with nuclear weapons is severely dented, the determination to fortifying deterrence gets stronger in the vain hope of coping with likely escalation of war, a wa war which may have heightened nuclear risk. So this uh, dialectic or this paradox is uh, uh, staring us. Now, this paradox is actually born out of the deterrence track, which is the bane of nuclear disarmament, which was also mentioned in the morning. It is important to reassert the utter futility of deterrence constructs and to reaffirm, as the Ban Treaty does, the illegit Ban Treaty is the short term for the uh, Treaty on Pro Pro Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which was mentioned in the morning. So the Ban Treaty uh, does, uh, first, the illegitimacy of nuclear weapons. It emphasizes the, un emphasizes the unconditional forswearing of the use or threat of use of these weapons and a comprehensive prohibition of nuclear weapons. Ban Treaty may have its downsides, and non-participation of nuclear weapon states is the key there. But what can be done to get the, non -nu the nuclear weapon states to be receptive to the framework of the Ban Treaty? This is the question. This at a time when breakdown of effective communication and dialogue between the great powers stares us into an abyss. It is of utmost importance to restore communication and dialogue instead of war talk and sanctions. No first use is one critical step, which must be the highest priority today. And this was mentioned in the morning. As regards Ukraine, almost routinely the media of both sides bemoan the dark forebodings of likely use of nuclear weapons in some form or other, and the threat of such use. Now, despite the chant of the mantra of President Reagan that nuclear war cannot be won and must not never be fought. But if you chant that mantra, why not just accept no first use as the law? Just as after the horrendous suffering and devastation of the First World War, the Geneva Protocol was adopted which eschewed first use of chemical weapons and biological weapons. Now, does the world have to go through one more catastrophic phase of wanton destruction to come to senses? Even though this time, that will risk annihilation. You know, deterrence actually reminds me of a very common uh, saying in, uh, in Hindi, uh, which is that, ek jhoot ko bachane ke liye so jhoot bolna. So that deterrence in the first instance was a lie. They had a bomb, they wanted to keep it. Then the other guy got the bomb, he wanted to keep it. So they started constructing, how can I justify? And the rest of the world was up in arms. I mean, you had Russell Einstein manifesto, which said, this is not on. So they started constructing this deterrence, uh, you know, dialectic. And it continues in various forms and manifestations. But and today again, a whole heap of lies are being uh, uh, given out. Now, I, uh, you know, I want to point out to your discussion uh, something which is very relevant. Uh, Henry Kissinger, William Perry, and Sam Nunn, they revealed in an article in March 2021 that Reagan, and I quote, considered nuclear weapons 
to be totally irrational, totally inhumane, good for nothing but killing, possibly destructive of life on earth and civilization. And Reagan took that view and his most trusted advocate for it, that is George Shultz, who was the Secretary of State, to a summit with Soviet leader Michael Gorbachev in Reykjavik in Ireland, Iceland in 1986. Reagan and Gorbachev were not able to agree at Reykjavik to get rid of all nuclear weapons, but they did succeed in turning the nuclear arms race on its head, initiating steps leading to significant reductions in deployed deployed long-range and intermediate-range nuclear weapons, including the elimination of an entire class of missiles. Now, this quotation uh, from coming from Kissinger, Perry, and Sam Nunn, who are Republicans, uh, is very illuminating. And the fact that Reagan in 1980s talk of, thought about this, and that's how he talked about obsolescence of nuclear weapons, and he worked about on strategic defense initiative. But in this article, Kissinger and his, uh, his uh, uh, fellow authors, they propose five points, which I thought are very relevant to your discussions. Uh, and these po points they actually did in memory of George Schultz, who passed away in 2021. Uh, first is the need for a bold policy to walk back from these increased perils. This will require a united effort from Washington and US allies on a policy that reduces nuclear danger while maintaining our values and protecting our vital interests. Now, we have a lot of tons of salt about when they talk about values and vital interests, but the main point is walking back. Second, for many decades, memories of a smoldering Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the fear generated by the Cuban Missile Crisis informed and drove nuclear policy. As George Schultz told Congress three years ago, and I quote, I fear people have lost that sense of dread, unquote. I feel very strongly that even when we discuss this nuclear disarmament, uh, we should first bring out the horrendous consequences of the use of nuclear weapons, because maybe a, a new generation has come which did not see what happened to Hiroshima and which did not see what are the consequences. like. What will happen if a bomb is uh, dropped in uh, East Delhi, where the population density is something like 40,000 per square kilometers? The incineration which will follow, the radiation, the heat, the blast, all this one should understand. It is not science fiction, it is reality. But, uh, and someone like George Schultz, who is US Secretary of State, who negotiated the summit, he's saying this to the Congress, that people have lost uh, the feeling for this. I feel it is important. Leaders of the countries with nuclear weapons must recognize their responsibility to work together to prevent catastrophe. Third point, we must take action on practical steps that will reduce the risk of nuclear use today while making the vision possible. Here, there are signs of progress. Now, this is 21 March when uh, Biden had come back and he started, uh, he, he actually put the INF, uh, the start, New START Treaty back and he, he said he would like to continue talking with the Soviets, uh, with the Russians. So he, he actually says that Biden and Putin have agreed to extend the New York START Treaty for five years. But as uh, Professor Mahapatra said this morning, that Putin has now said no, no to talks. But there is much work to be done in that context, including securing nuclear materials to prevent catastrophic terrorism. Fourth, nuclear weapon states should commit to conduct their own internal reviews of their command and control and early warning systems. These fail-safe reviews would identify steps to strengthen protections against cyber threats and unauthorized, inadvertent, or accidental use of nuclear weapons. These reviews should also include options for establishing agreements between nuclear powers, precluding cyber attacks on nuclear command and control or early warning assets. I am repeating this in toto because this is coming from the, you know, the uh, exponent of nuclear weapons, Kissinger, for instance, uh, and uh, Perry uh, and Sam Nunn. And the fifth point, creating robust and, uh, and accepted methods to maximize decision making and to, sorry, to create robust and accepted methods to maximize 
decision time during heightened tensions and extreme situations. This is the risk reduction which Manpreet was talking about, especially when leaders fear they may be under threat of attack. Could be a common conceptual goal that connects both immediate and longer term steps for managing st instability and building mutual security. Now, these five points coming from the US uh, uh, you know, veterans are very relevant because uh, it is not the peace movement people, it is not the non-nuclear weapon state or non-nuclear uh, disarmament enthusiasts who are talking. It is these guys who have been dealing with these weapons. But uh, I want to mention that you know, this whole uh, arena of nuclear disarmament is full of uh, egos and vanities. Now, Tom Schelling doesn't like Kissinger because he, he actually when he came, he put these guys aside. So Tom Schelling comes out in 2009, rejecting what Kissinger and company were saying in 2007. 2007, Kissinger and the same fellows, they talked about elimination of nuclear weapons because they felt terrorism, suicide terrorism could not be dealt with. So Tom Schelling had to come back in 2009 after Obama's speech that no, no, elimination is not possible. So even within the US, you have these e brute, you know, huge egos. And these huge egos is what we, we need to grapple with even in our midst and in whatever we do because uh, uh, like Mahatma Gandhi's uh, words that, that you know uh, you have to be humble to pursue these things and otherwise you will lose track. Uh, public pressure on government's work but present day media has perversely built up a right wing macho uh, atmosphere across even those societies which carried the flame of a promising future based on compassion, engagement, inclusion, human dignity, and freedom. In this situation, no compromise can be permitted with forces of division and brutalized authoritarianism. I feel that uh, this is the basic point for working on nuclear disarmament, that uh, you have to reject this whole uh, authoritarianism and uh, you know this brutalized uh, approach to warfare, uh, you know, the, the mention of war was mentioned. The idealism and the principles of the UN Charter actually are the cri de cur today. They, they, they mentioned very clearly the scourge of war should be there and uh, Jayant quoted uh, from the uh, um, Charter. And division of those ideals will be catastrophic. Uh, and I have finally come to involvement of women uh, and uh, as I referred to the uh, Lincoln film, I also feel that women's movement, when you look back along the long steep last 50 years, 60 years, they have made huge progress and they were working against tremendous odds. But it is their tenacity of purpose and their determination which continued. This determination is required in disarmament. And there was reference to Greenham Common, I think, in the morning. These women are a real, uh, you know, torch bearers. 1981, they started. They went to that place in, in UK, in Wales, and they wanted to prevent deployment of Pershing two missiles. One of them lost uh, his, her life. And there were 30,000 in the beginning. In 1982, January, there were 50,000. And the British government, like we have been used to, the colonial power, they tried all their tricks to prevent them. They even uh, made buses misdirect them. So they took them, the buses took them eight kilometers away from the Greenham Common site. So, you know, but it didn't work. That Greenham Common women, they continued, the finally INF Treaty happened, so these missiles were never deployed. And they stopped in 2000. But similar women uh, are there in operation in the US. They, some years back, there were women who went to the uh, Los Angeles, uh, Las, Ve Las Vegas, uh, sorry, uh, Los Almas and uh, climb the uh, railings and went inside and put uh, you know a sticker there just to prove that, that look your security of nuclear weapons I, I, you know it's a mockery so this these women that continuing and the editor of the bulletin of atomic scientists Rachel Bronson is carrying the torch now so my I'm mentioning these things because uh, I want to say that from women we must get inspiration to work on nuclear disarmament, and their, uh, you know, their field is uh, is uh, is a kind of a, a beacon of light. 
I have taken a lot of time, but I felt that what I say may be relevant for your discussion. So I will now give the floor to Dr. Rashmi Kadhi. One more speaker on your panel uh, was Smita Singh, who will be making her presentation on WPS. Uh, and Smita is currently working as a legislative officer in the Lok Sabha Secretariat, uh, where she previously held the position of a commi uh, committee officer in the Parliamentary Committee on External Affairs. She's a member of the Research Advisory Committee of the Center for Social Research, New Delhi, for the project Gender Mainstreaming in Indian Foreign Policy. She's a former Next Generation Fellow and a member of the Women in uh, uh, international security, which in some se in some ways, Smita was our foremother. Viscomp was built on the on the basis of the Wise uh, template. They call themselves Wise, actually, mm -hmm. which is based in BC, and she's a PhD candidate for diplomacy disarmament at G uh, JNU, from where she finished her MPhil in disarmament. And and I'm happy to also say that she was she studied political science at Lady Sri Ram College. She's been awarded a senior research fellowship in international relations from the UGC. So um, I overlooked introducing you earlier, Shmita. Thank you. I take liberties with students sometimes. <laughs> Please, go ahead. So, uh, Dr. Kazi. Thank you. Good afternoon. 10 minutes on speaking to a bong woman is indeed a challenge. <laughs> Just as the future for verification, nuclear verification is. I will manage, I hope our world community also manages on this. The centrality of nuclear disarmament verification for arms control, nuclear non-proliferation, and nuclear disarmament negotiation is indeed indispensable for attaining a nuclear weapons-free world. But this goal is severely constrained by challenges of verification. How much is enough? How much verification is enough? What convinces the inspector that the state has indeed declared all its nuclear warheads? In fact, to facilitate effective verification, a specific list of warheads, activities, personnel, and facilities may be selected for monitoring, and the inspector may not need to access to the entire nuclear weapons complex. But is this, is this uh, a comprehensive verification scheme, which we can say it, it will be foolproof? Obviously, this brings us to the value of nuclear disarmament verification. When we talk about NDV, it essentially involves gathering and analyzing of information to make a judgment about parties' compliance or non-compliance with a treaty or agreement, which is indeed for promoting disarmament in either of these two senses. And it brings us to the rationale, obviously that is to develop a credible, reliable, and accurate verification techniques and arrangements which are crucial for the nuclear disarmament process. So in that regard, verification becomes an important component and an essential confidence-building measure for removing suspicions and mistrust. The effect is increased transparency and trust amongst nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, obviously to ensure compliance with treaty provisions and to support implementation and enforcement. Now this is essential because verification process needs to zero in those exact processes in order to facilitate authentication procedures without risking safety measures or divulging any kind of national security information or interest uh, uh, <coughs> concerning states. And this is in perfect sync with Article 6 of the NPT, which commits all parties to abolish nuclear weapons for a confidence-inspiring verification process. We have been enthusiastic about nuclear disarmament verification. This is not something new. There has been uh, enthusiasm on this. We have progressed, evolved, uh, progressively evolved on this issue throughout the nuclear era. So the United Nations General Assembly in January 1946 presented the first resolution to address the goal of eliminating nuclear weapons and other weapons for effective inspection. After, all, uh, after that, post Hiroshima Nagasaki, 
we saw the uh, Ikesan Linenthal report of March 1946. This developed into the Bharuch plan. Uh, unfortunately, the failure of both these plans, we are witness to the fact it escalated dangerous nuclear arms race between the US and former USSR during the Cold War. But the enthusiasm did not die down. 2000 NPT review conference, the, NPT, the, the nuclear weapon states committed to placing as soon as practicable fissile materials that are no longer required for defense purposes under IAEA inspections uh, and other relevant international verification. 2010 REFCON, it affirmed the commitment of, uh, to the total elimination of nuclear weapons on the principles of irreversibility, verifiability, and transparency. In 2016, ANGA called upon all states to develop and strengthen effective NDV measures for confidence building. Off late, in recent times, we have again effective measures and proposals. So group of governmental experts, this was established in two, uh, December 2006. The government to government arrangements and interactions through qualified experts, it constitutes an effective format essentially to establish and sustain credible and agreeable verification methods. And there are several examples of the GEE assigned to provide recommendations on issues related to arms control, non-proliferation, and nuclear disarmament fields. In fact, in 2018, the GEE in a background paper submitted by Germany took consideration of the historic milestones to advance NDV. Thereafter, in November 2018, the GEE presented, represented by the United Kingdom and Indonesia submitted a paper titled Nuclear Disarmament Verification Building Capacity to consider the role of the state's building uh, capacity in verification measures as a tool to progress multilateral NDV measures. Thereafter, again, in September, um, in, in September 2018, earlier, the GEE expressed general agreement that nuclear Non-nuclear weapon states, they also have a legitimate interest in participating in the process of nuclear disarmament measures. The trilateral <coughs> initiative, this is another measure where the US, Russia, and the IAEA with the aim to establish a joint group to consider various legal, technical, and financial issues have been associated with IAEA verifications on relevant fissile materials. In fact, the IAEA verification under this initiative the idea is to uh, promote international confidence that fissile materials made irrevocably removed from nuclear weapons uh, programs. The trilateral initiatives has by now held over 98 such events that has led to substantial progress on verification arrangements, and it has enabled IAEA to carry out such a mission without gaining access to design or manufacturing secrets that are associated with nuclear weapons, which is a major concern when it comes to verification measures. But despite the success of the trilateral initiatives, US and Russia, they have brought the initiative to an halt over the support to 13 point Article 6 agenda from the NPT, 2000 NPT. In fact, it ended in 2002, but the, we can still be optimistic about it because it can still serve as a basis for bilateral agreements between the IAEA and the nuclear weapon states that wish to demonstrate in a verifiable manner the release of weapons organ, origin and other fissile materials from dis defense programs. The UK-US uh, Technical Cooperation Program, this also supports the IAEA's Technical Cooperation Program, which plays a vital role in delivering safe and secure exchange of nuclear technologies and expertise for peaceful purposes. In fact, it strikes a relevant balance between information protection and information sufficiency, which is again an effective mecha mechanism for verification and monitoring processes. The successful technical collaboration between the US and UK is a, uh, uh, it can, it can, uh, it can be a precursor for future engagements between them, which is desirable, you know, in the face of existing challenges in nuclear weapons arms control verification. The UK-Norway initiative is another such initiative which investigated the potential role of the non-nuclear weapon states in the process of verifying nuclear uh, warhead dismantlement. In fact, this initiative marked for the first time a nuclear weapon state and a non-nuclear weapon state has worked together, as you can make from the, uh, uh, the, the countries that are involved here, UK and Norway, you know, that they can explore the challenges of nuclear arms control and nuclear disarmament measures. It opened the possibilities to explore what verification means and the procedures that would be necessary to dismantle uh, warheads without again compromising on 
uh, information which is sensitive. This inf initiative has also ran into a series of you know, control exercises. It has designed to rigorously assess the impact of human factors on verification processes, which again is a very important aspect. Human reliability constitutes a very important aspect when it comes to verification uh, issues, because trust is a factor which is involved here. The IPNDV, which was established in 2014, this is again an ongoing initiative. It includes more than 25 countries with or without no, uh, nuclear weapons. It has identified critical gaps and challenges that are associated with monitoring and verifying nuclear disarmament. The idea is to build and diversify international capacity and expertise concerning monitoring and verification. The limitation to the IPNDV uh, is that it is seen as a source of ideas to the GEE. And um, uh, with the withdrawal of Russia and China in 2017, it has had its limitations. But despite this, the partnership does hold the promise of you know, uh, a, a gamut of valuable data that, again, is very relevant for the uh, GEE. We have other institutional and regional verification arrangements. To start with, the IAEA. It is a unique international authority with long-standing non-proliferation verification uh, experience. We are all aware of that. In fact, the 50th General Conference of the IAEA had noted that the agency must remain ready to assist with verification tasks under nuclear disarmament uh, agreements. It has already played uh, a, a major role in the negotiations uh, of proposed FMCT, the C uh, CTBT, and uh, nuclear weapon-free zones. Uh, which are significant and are long overdue steps towards multilateral uh, disarmament measures. In fact, the uh, non-nuclear weapon states, uh, uh, we, we know that they have no obligation to accept the IAEA safeguards. But the uh, fact is that the expansion of IAEA safeguards to all peaceful nuclear materials and activities in a disarmed state will definitely make a vital contribution to building confidence in nuclear disarmament. We must acknowledge that. The IAEA has already verified a range of disarmament activities in South Africa, Iraq, Libya, former Soviet Union. And in the 21st century, one can say that stronger the IAEA's role in implementing and verifying nuclear disarmament con commitments, the better will be the effectiveness in performing uh, <coughs> nuclear disarmament verification measures. The European Union, it has remained committed to the pursuit of NDV and believes in enabling verification of disarmament process that will contribute to the full implementation of Article 6. It extends supports to the uh, effectiveness of the IAEA-based Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement and additional protocol, which are, again, indispensable aspects in the current verification standards. It is committed to uh, entry into force and universalization of the CTPT and has uh, uh, agreed to provide diplomatic and financial support to these initiatives. There are stresses. It, it also stresses the relevance of multilateral negotiating forums, such as the Conference on Disarmament. In fact, the EU welcomed the joint Franco-German exercise on NDV uh, in September 2019 uh, for developing multilateral nuclear disarmament verification measures. And it has also emphasized on effective collaboration between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, which again, you know, uh, can affect uh, 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 transparency, irreversibility, and verifiability without any conciliation on proliferation security, uh, proliferation sensitive information. The GSCAP, Geneva Center for Security Policy, this has been also an effective forum that has been arranging inclusive environment for the global community from over 184 nations to come together to exchange ideas to develop sustainable solutions for a peaceful future. It works on the principles of impartiality, independence, and inclusiveness, which makes it a very sought-after platform for Track 1.5 and 2 diplomacy. It has also worked on conceptual uh, it has organized several workshops on uh, important uh, issues like New Star Treaty, Intermediate Nuclear Forces, NPT, IAEA, CTBT, CWC. And it emphasizes on the importance of capacity building in order to address the existing gaps in the capacity of bilateral verification regimes for effective nuclear disarmament verification at the global level. Apart from this, we have talked about the, uh, on the Treaty of uh, uh, the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, we've heard much about it since morning. Uh, then the UNIDIR. Uh, this has also explored various provisions. In fact, uh, it has highlighted the potential risk of miscalculation, inadvertent escalation, or accidental use of TNWs in crisis situation. And to that extent, it has suggested transfer of nuclear warheads associated with non-strategic delivery systems to a small number of storage facilities and demating them you know, from nuclear capable uh, verification, uh, 
uh, delivery systems to aid and uh, confirm the absence of deployed nuclear weapons at those bases. The Vertic has also played a hugely important role in this regard. It believes in the motto of building trust through verification, which is an important uh, uh, element in this whole puzzle of non-proliferation regime, trust. And this is what uh, the Vertic has played its, uh, uh, its uh, role in. It supports the development, implementation, and verification of international agreements and related regional and national initiatives in an impartial manner. The role of civil society. One cannot overlook that. It has an important role to play in achieving the goal of an effective and reliable verification regime because societal norms help us in building and developing a safe world, which are important influences for accelerating the progress on nuclear disarmament. There are democratic principles and values of a nation, which plays a hugely important role, a colossal role in bolstering disarmament norms and increasing pressure to trust and improve the verification process. And in this regard, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, uh, 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 ICANN, it has played an active role, um, and it has supported the TPNW to sig stigmatize, prohibit, and abolish nuclear weapons. Reaching critical will, is the disarmament program of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILF. And it pursues the goal of disarmament and arms control of nuclear weapons and many different weapon systems. The issue of nuclear disarmament verification is not a done job. Much remains to be done in order to establish, develop, and sustain a comprehensive nuclear disarmament verification regime. With strong leadership at the top levels, commitment followed up by action, non-discriminatory process, transparency, and of course, diplomatic investment. Nuclear disarmament verification is a crucial requirement to establish a world free of nuclear weapons, and the process is complex. But to realize this goal, the responsibility has to be shared by all stakeholders, and we all have a stake in attaining and maintaining a world free of nuclear weapons. I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, I now give the floor to Dr. Kanika Rakra. Hello. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, also, thank you to everyone who stayed back after lunch. I know it was a good lunch, so thank you so much to Viscom for organizing this entire event so well. Um, I'd also like to sort of bring to the notice that uh, all three women on this table are actually CPOD uh, alumni. So <laughs> good on <laughs> that part as well. Um, okay, so my topic today is on nuclear risk reduction and disarmament. At the recently, uh, prior to the recently concluded 10th NPT RevCon, uh, there was a conference that was held on effective measures for nuclear disarmament, which was where we had uh, Her Excellency Mrs. Umi Nakamitsu, who is the under UN Under Secretary General for Disarmament Affairs, speak about the concept of risk. Which she, where she said that nuclear risk has, is becoming acute and that the threat of use of a nuclear weapon is not an abstract th threat but a real one. Another aspect that she pointed out uh, in her talks was also that she highlighted uh, was the purpose of disarmament has always been to enhance security, human, national and collective security. And these are the two aspects that I shall try to uh, talk about a little bit in my remarks today. Do the two converge? What is the impact that they have on each other? Are they positive or negative? Uh, when we look at the definition of nuclear risk reduction, it primarily looks at the range of activities uh, to improve the safety and security of nuclear weapons, reduce the risk of accidents, and prevent terrorists from obtaining nuclear materials. UNIDID has done some significant work on this, so where it discusses uh, uh, some exceptional work, a uh, series of events actually on nuclear risk reduction. And one of the things that it has highlighted that I found very useful and relevant were uh, a compilation of all the different types of risk reduction strategies, the doctrines, the strategy, the operations, and uh, the t uh, transparency. These are the four uh, categories in which it sort of looks at uh, nuclear risk reduction measures. And I'd just like you to bear with me for a bit as I go through uh, some of the points that are uh, part of these uh, four categories. So with doctrines, there is the commitment of non-use or threat of use, declaratory policy on avoiding the nuclear, nuclear use, uh, extension of nuclear security assurances, established principles around nuclear weapon possession. In strategy, we have uh, protection of nuclear-related related technological systems, uh, agreement not to attack nuclear-related facilities, restriction on the nature of deployment, changes in deployment patterns and alert status, 
and in operations we have concepts such as uh, strengthen, strengthen human assessment and decision making, physical separation of nuclear weapons, mechanisms to delay, disrupt or deactivate launch and uh, uh, pre-notification of actions susceptible to misinterpretation. Uh, in the fourth con concept we have transparency which is high level dialogue on pertinent issues, uh, information exchange on issues, communication in crisis uh, simulations and notification of uh, nuclear related incidents. Even when I'm listing these out, uh, similar to what Chintamani sir had done in the morning, the reactions uh, when you hear these statements are, sounds good on paper. Uh, and these four categories, the activities and, the, and many of the proposals that have been suggested with, uh, with, uh, within this document seem disconnected from our current geopolitical reality. And this document that I'm quoting from is from 2019 which is not so far back in the day as well, but it just goes to show that in the last couple of years, so much has changed that we can't even uh, read through these lines or hear these lines without uh, a smirk or a grin at some point. Primarily, this is uh, this, uh, because the insecurities that have, uh, have heightened in such a way. Now, the uh, regional and global overlap with respect to state insecurities has of, of definitely grown, and nuclear risk reduction is not only required uh, in the Northeast Asia or South Asian region, but in Europe and the Trans-Pacific, the two new sort of areas that have come as, an uh, as a regional hub for these discussions. Uh, nuclear risk reduction, if we go back in history, began in earnest during the Cold War, US and the Soviet Union worked together to ensure prevention of nuclear weapons. And anyone who has engaged in uh, negotiations, and Ambassador Shilkan Sharma is here, we had uh, ambassadors in the last session as well, will know that even bilateral negotiations have so many layers within them that to think that to bring that, uh, uh, to change that dynamic from a bilateral to a tri trilateral negotiation would require so many more levels and changes and the discussions that the success rate reduces dramatically just by adding another player in the, the negotiation on the negotiation table. Uh, when we look at the trajectory of nuclear risk reduction, that is also something that is evident because we, uh, when it was a bilateral discussion, it was there was some success rate, especially during the Cold War. Then there was this, there was this discussion of trying to bring China into the foray uh, within discussions. And as soon as that happened, you re the bilateral negotiation treaties also started falling through. So um, this is the sort of part that I wanted to highlight on where nuclear risk reduction is and has been. Now there are two competing arguments that I seem to have discovered or uh, found in my research uh, on how nuclear risk reduction and disarmament are related. One is by uh, Ambassador da uh, Rakesh Sood who points out that uh, the concept of nuclear risk reduction and disarmament don't go together because uh, if you, when you look at nuclear risk reduction, it means that you're accepting that nuclear is a part of your security dynamic which means that disarmament is, uh, uh, will never happen and is going to remain elusive uh, for as long as nuclear risk reduction is going to happen. The other and more popular sort of uh, argument is that the way to disarmament is via nuclear risk reduction only and nuclear risk reduction and also arms control uh, as a part of that discussion. We find that many proponents of this argument, especially during the pe period when we were seeing treaties fall like nine pins, there were uh, arms control enthusiasts were sh uh, shouting themselves hoarse saying that no this is the only way to nuclear disarmament. But there is almost no uh, uh, treaty at this point of standing and we are neither close nor away from the concept of disarmament. So it does put into question the fact that whether we, uh, if nuclear risk reduction is happening or is not happening, how far or close we are to disarmament as a concept. So hypothetically, if even if we were to include China in the trilateral conversation of US, Russia and uh, China, uh, would it impact the uh, risk reduction in a significant way or would it impact disarmament in a significant way? This is, uh, when we sort of put this out to question, and when I try to uh, look at this question, then the obvious uh, sort of rebuttal comes that the doctrine, strategy, transparency are still as important as categories as uh, they were before. So it doesn't mean that these are not important. So I'm actually going to touch upon what Chintamani sir had pointed out that just because equality and liberty are not have not been attained, we shouldn't try towards, we shouldn't work towards them. Similarly for disarmament, I think as long as uh, uh, it may not be the only way, nuclear risk reduction may not be the only way to disarmament, but it is. Uh, but when nuclear risk reduction takes place, 
uh, we observe or at least there is a sense of perception within state structures and civil society and academia that there is progress towards disarmament. And that in itself is also a goal to be achieved because at least you feel that you are moving forward. You may or may not be going forward, but at least the direction seems to be there. Uh, so while I agree with Ambassador Sood that nuclear reduction tacitly does imply that uh, the nuclear is a part of the security dynamic of a state, I also believe that uh, uh, arms control enthusiasts do have a point when they say that nuclear risk reduction has a perspective to offer and gives a sense of hope and support to state structures that disarmament is not so far away. I'd like to just uh, sort of uh, conclude my small remarks by saying that I, uh, there is an idea that I'm trying to explore within this chapter as well, where I look at the concept of responsibility and uh, touching upon what Reshmi was pointing about, because when we look at nuclear risk reduction, the immediate sort of link that comes through is that of verification and monitoring. And given the current geopolitical scenario, when we know that verification and monitoring is going to be even tougher uh, as we go along, it might be a good idea to look at the concept of nuclear responsibility within the nuclear uh, risk reduction structures to see that if maybe we are, if all states are responsible about risk reduction and try to take that conversation forward, then it could be a positive and substantive step in that manner. Thank you. Thank you. And present. For a very, very successful uh, survey of uh, risk reduction. Uh, yes, I do not have a PPT, but just that uh, it's a post-lunch session. I thought it's better to stand so that I can understand the retention capacity of my listeners. And I promise I'll stick to the 10 minutes. Uh, I'll begin with thanking uh, Viscomp and Dr. Gopinath for organizing this event. And uh, thank you, Dr. Manpreet Sethi and Kanika for asking me to contribute a chapter in their upcoming project. To start with, uh, the views I express here are personal and not of the Parliamentary Secretariat. I'll be talking about India and the WPS agenda. While my chapter focuses on three dimensions, uh, I'll uh, keep my talk short and focus mostly on what how India has engaged with the WPS principles and the WPS architecture. So with a focus on analyzing the nature, content, and implementation of the WPS agenda in general, and in particular, India, the chapter which I have submitted focuses on three sections. The first uh, part takes stock of uh, the content, the evolution, and the contours of the WPS architecture. While the WPS resolutions have informed meaningful action in the broader field of peace and security, the normative and practical convergences with arms control have remained unexplored. Therefore, the second part in the chapter focuses on the linkages between the WPS agenda and arms control. The final section analyzes the manner in which India has engaged with the WPS agenda and incorporated its principles in the foreign policy agenda I will be focusing only on the foreign policy aspects and not on the domestic part of uh, the WPS agenda for obvious reasons. So despite existence, I think it has been reiterated by a previous uh, panelist and speakers as well about how there are enough evidence to suggest how uh, women, the positive role women have played in lasting peace and conflict resolutions they were not relegated the due, uh, given the due recognition for a considerable period of time. But with the UNS, UNSC Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security in 20, 2000, 2000, it was historic in many ways. Firstly, for the first time, it documented the disproportionate and distinctive impact of armed conflict on women and recognized their contribution in conflict prevention prevention, conflict resolution, peacekeeping, and peace building, and also because it was mostly driven by civil society organizations. 
The obligation to these resolution extends from the international to the national. The WPS agenda has interested the member states, Secretary General, UN entities, and Security Council with a significant role in advancing the WPS agenda. In pursuance to the UNSC Resolution 2467, which was adopted in 2019, the UN Secretary General annually reports to the Security Council regarding uh, the implementation of the WPS resolution. With a view to fast track progress uh, on the implementational aspect, the Secretary General has been sub had submitted in 2000 a set of indicators for use at the global level to track the implementation of the UNSR UNSC 1325. Following this call, the Secretary General in its report submitted a list of 26 global indicators. These, indica these indicators are organized along four thematic pillar pillars, prevention, participation, protection, and relief and recovery. Even after uh, nearly two decades of adoption of the UNSC Resolution 1325, its implementation remains patchy and fragmentary. We do see certain gaps, inconsistencies in the WPS agenda, some of which are uh, the, despite being a uh, larger, you know, it has been come across through the efforts of the civil society organization. In implementation, the focus has shifted mostly to the states. So it does follow a very traditional notion of security with a focus primarily on militarism and statism rather than on a peaceful resolution and uh, human security. Then there is incoherence in language and agenda. We do see it is mentioned in 10 resolutions. There is no one specific document that contains the UNSC, the WPS agenda. So there is uh, differing interpretations of the various resolutions and which has given some sort of an alibi to the states for non-implementation. With regard to India, and again, I repeat, I'll be focusing only on the foreign policy aspect. India has uh, reiterated and advocated gender equality at various international forums. National Action Plan is an effective instrument in fixing priorities, defining responsibilities, allocating funds, and initiating actions in a time-bound manner for the WPS agenda. So despite uh, 20 years, India has not developed a national action plan for its implementation. So we'll ha have a look uh, that in, there's no dearth of commitment, but India's approach to WPS has mostly been governed by some sort of an hesitancy in coming out with uh, a document in support of the WPS agenda. And that is why one of the reasons India does not have a national action plan and also a refugee policy, if I may just divert a bit. With regard to UN uh, peacekeeping and disarmament, India has been one of the largest troop contributors to the UN peacekeeping missions. As of April 2022, India is the third last largest troop contributor with 5,581 personnel deployed in nine out of 16 active UN peacekeeping missions. On the uh, on the political representation and participation, which is a valuable indicator of democratic framework of a country, despite constituting half of the electorate population, we have not been able to get adequate political representation. In the 2019 Lok Sabha election, we currently stand with 14.58% of women in the Indian Parliament. In the Lok Sabha, in the lower house, and 12.3% in the upper house Rajya Sabha of the Indian Parliament. But there has been a very, very progressive trend. We have seen that the gender gap in electoral turnout in 2019 election has been very positive. For the first time, women outnumbered men in voting. So this is one thing, but it has this silent feminization in terms of women voters have not translated into more political representation. That is something uh, we need to work on. And I am hopeful that uh, we might have the Women Reservation Bill in the upcoming years, maybe in a year or two. I'm just hopeful. Uh, 
So what, what can we do about it? Why has India been so reticent, so hesitant in uh, getting the WPS agenda or coming up with a well-documented policy? I have, I have identified three major reasons. One, of course, we are a patriarchal society and we still can't convince people why you need a foreign a women oriented foreign policy because we still uh, adhere to a gender neutral foreign policy and traditional notion of uh, understanding of uh, our foreign policy. Then also with regard to WPS agenda, the problem with regard to non-formulation of a national action plan also emanates from the fact that in that particular uh, plan, we have to talk about the internal aspect. And the government position has been very clear on this particular area that we have no conflict internally. So since we have no conflict internally, why do we need a plan? So I think that is one of the reason if we have seen in uh, the foreign, in the external dimension, India has a lot of ground to come out with a, pay, a plan, but it's the internal dimension that has restricted mostly with regard to formulation of an NAP. So what can India do to overcome these reticence, these limitations, these constraints? And how can uh, we move towards a better engagement with the WPS principles? The first uh, policy recommendation which I would give in the paper is come up with a foreign policy document. See, if India cannot formulate a national action plan, India can certainly come up with a foreign policy document having a gendered uh, section, maybe a, a chapter on how India, foreign, India's foreign policy can be gendered. I still am very uh, critical that we can have a feminist foreign policy. Uh, I don't think the word feminism still, uh, I think still makes people uncomfortable in the government setup. So gender mainstreaming, gender responsive, gender sensitive could be a better terminology when we talk about Indian foreign policy. Then uh, we can have more political representation of women in leadership positions in political uh, parties of course, the Women Reservation Bill, if introduced, could be the right step in the right direction. And, uh, and I think it can be introduced, not because it is a good policy, but it's a smart policy even for the ruling government. Because if you look at the data, the figures, the outnumbered women <coughs> as voters have mostly voted for BJP. So in that sense, I think it is a politically expedient and smart policy that the government might consider in the coming years. Then uh, at the organizational level, we can have more ambassadors. We can have better representation of women at the Ministry of External Affairs itself, where uh, foreign policies are mostly formulated, discussed, and uh, in, at the diplomatic level, at the disarmament diplomacy level. So this is with this, I think I'll just uh, stop my, I think I'll just conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for dealing with a difficult subject uh, so well. Uh, we have now uh, Air Marshal Rajesh Kumar uh, for his uh, comments. Thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador, and thank you, uh, Dr. Minakshi Gopinath, for uh, inviting me here, and uh, Viscomp, and also uh, Dr. Sethi for. Uh, uh, bringing me here. Um, I just want to say that, uh, you know, in this whole game of uh, uh, disarmament, uh, we've seen a whole lot of speakers talk about a large landscape. And, uh, uh, you know, Professor Mahapatra, I think, started with the bad news and good news. I'll, I'll reverse the order. I'll start with the good news first, and then we'll go on to the bad news. Uh, see, the disarmament uh, uh, whole thing started with the great gusto because of the horror of nuclear weapons. And in fact, uh, I'll uh, refer to the 1962 Cuban crisis as that even as Americans won the right for Russians to remove um, their missiles from Cuba, they were still a force of peace which propelled disarmament forward by not gloating about victory. When the 1962 crisis took place, they did not 
uh, I think the press coverage, the media coverage and everything was restrained in the manner that it was an agreement rather than a victory. So uh, US was a force of peace because it had used nuclear weapons and it had seen the horror of nuclear weapons. And that is how uh, we were able to continue on this good news of, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, disarmament, which despite the arms race subsequently led to the INF Treaty and then thereafter reduction in the total number of nuclear weapons and the START treaties and so on and the success of the, uh, you know, uh, megatons to megawatts, uh, uh, you know, uh, program and things like that. Uh, but it is all like uh, uh, Dr. Akra said, all these treaties have fallen like nine pins. Uh, it's because uh, of lack of trust and the changing leo geopolitical landscape, which uh, uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Jain Prasad had so eloquently uh, uh, told us in the morning as to what is happening on the uh, uh, you know geopolitical landscape. And uh, everybody acknowledges that these are turbulent times and that is where the bad news comes in because um, the the countries who are looking at the way geopolitics is turning out today uh, are really worried whether they will be able to survive without nuclear weapons or a nuclear umbrella. So uh, the fact is that uh, I believe that this whole structure has come about because of two or three fundamental changes. One is that European leaders, very senior leaders, acknowledge in private that US is no longer a force of peace, but it is a force which encourages conflict. Uh, and it is borne out because after 1991, by being the sole superpower, they started disregarding some of the norms of nuclear behavior, which they were not called out for. And therefore, um, other countries then started to compare themselves to that bad behavior and were testing the limits of the behavior of all treaties. And uh, therefore, I feel that this fundamental change that took place uh, uh, in the 90s has contributed to what we see today. The second thing that has contributed is the rise of China. The rise of China has not been peaceful and the increasing muscularity with which China asserts itself is, uh, is cause for turbulence. Um, you find that the what is North Korea and what is Pakistan, they are both China. They have been armed, they have been given the technology and they have been supplied, uh, uh, you know, uh, everything what they want for proliferation with uh, and under very benign uh, oversight. So uh, this, and China has not been called out for its bad behavior. So therefore, other nations also start thinking that if these countries can get away with bad behavior, we can get away with bad behavior as well. And uh, the third factor is being the complacency of Europe. Europe thought that it didn't need a security infrastructure after 1991 and that uh, they dramatically cut down uh, uh, conventional arms funding, uh, relied solely on the nuclear umbrella, and eventually uh, landed up in a situation where today, if you see what is happening in the Ukraine war, I think there are many European countries who would like a ceasefire to take place, but are unfortunately forced to do America's bidding because they simply don't have capacity if they were to strike it out on their own. So these are some of the, the, the underpinnings what I thought was, uh, was have brought us to this state of bad news that we see uh, about uh, nuclear disarmament, where the trust uh, uh, has gone. The international institutions are not exercising oversight and there is an increasing tendency of great powers to, to bypass these institutions and to ignore whatever has been done on the, uh, with these institutions. So therefore, um, it, it's very impo uh, imperative in my view that if we are to look for disarmament and uh, it's a journey, like everybody said, I think the common thread amongst all the speakers has been saying that it is a journey towards disarmament. And if we have to look at that journey, 
I think the first step is to call out bad behavior. You have to hold people accountable for bad behavior. Only then will the limits, because um, th there is a difference between bending a rule and breaking it outrightly and doing something which is morally absolutely incorrect. So therefore, the, the extremes of behavior at least, we must start calling out so that the boundaries um, uh, start to emerge in our journey towards disarmament. Uh, and you will find that, uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, things that are, one is proliferation, the other is, of course, threatening non-nuclear states of use of nuclear weapons by nuclear weapon states is an absolute no-no. So, therefore, this is something that is, that, that should be a pillar on which the disarmament, uh, uh, one of the pillars on which disarmament must stand. And, uh, 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 those countries which have uh, leaked technology in violation of rules also have to be called out and have to be put under watch. So how are we going to do this? Of course, it's a different matter because these are all superpowers and they have veto powers in all, all the uh, areas. So you have to uh, figure out civil society has to start looking at ways and means of calling out this behavior and technology can help us do that. I mean, um, we talked about verification, but what about technology in verification? Today, you have satellites that can, uh, you know, uh, really um, uh, figure out who's doing what. It's not just looking. You can detect radioactivity. You can detect many of the signals and using AI, we can, we can democratize it. We can, uh, we can make sure it is civilian led and not state-led or military-led. And just the way you saw uh, in the Ukrainian war, when a lot of people from civil uh, uh, satellites uh, were looking at Russian troops advancing and warning Ukraine, we can do the same on nuclear disarmament. So technology and artificial intelligence is something that we should look at very carefully to, uh, to, to start um, observing and calling out bad behavior and, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, violation of treaties. Um, if you see India's stance on disarmament, uh, we all know that disarmament is one of the chapters in our nuclear doctrine. And uh, I think the very fact um, that uh, um, Russia, uh, threaten Ukraine with the uh, use of tactical nuclear weapons. It's a very good opportunity to start a dialogue on uh, disarmament uh, by uh, taking an initiative. And like uh, Dr. Sethi pointed out, maybe it'll lead to failure, but we must give it a shot because this is the right environment. This is the good news part of it, that we are, even though there is a ton of bad news and there's a huge dark cloud, there is a silver lining that if you uh, use this opportunity uh, and this uh, uh, pillar to kind of uh, uh, you know press for disarmament maybe some somehow the voice will be heard and i want to reiterate the point that uh, you know it oft quoted nuclear wars can uh, uh, never be fought uh, uh, one so they should never be fought i mean uh, it's all very nice to say lip service but what happened how did nuclear war fighting ever become mainstream uh, because we never called it out uh, the fact is that they were always meant to be strategic weapons to start with uh, in terms of us and then nato came up with this uh, uh, policy of flexible deterrence flexible response sorry and uh, uh, when they came up with this flexible response nobody called them out they say how can you use nuclear weapons on conventional soldiers and somehow, over a period of time, we have dehumanized the soldier. And that's where women come in. There are women soldiers now. So, uh, how can you dehumanize uh, soldiers by uh, exposing them to nuclear weapons? And nuclear weapons are not meant for war fighting. That is a, that is a um, you know, principle that should get enshrined in the dialogue. That, uh, uh, you know... Uh, we can't have this kind of a, a behavior 
and because now conflict termination strategies some people have started to believe can begin with tactical nuclear weapons this is absolutely incorrect um, it can never happen one nuke and the, the the game is over i think this is my view okay uh, we are going to have nuclear winter come what may even if you are not in the area that you are in so the fact is if you look at it how do you respond to a person who's uh, threatening a tactical nuclear weapon is to show your intent that it will not go unpunished and what happened in this entire russian uh, 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 thing was see there are two three indicators which you must see how it worked out first is even though nuclear forces were put on alert by russia <coughs> not a single nuclear force moved or changed its readiness status so it was it was clearly nuclear signaling then the second time in october when the threat was repeated what happened two ssbns by russia by america were physically shown to the russians so once surfaced in the arabian sea if you recollect the the cnc of uh, centcom boarded a ssbn in the middle of the arabian sea in mid october and then one week later another ssbn landed up in um, gibraltar and surfaced and docked so ssbns never surface it was a statement of intent that if you lose nuclear weapons we are ready and amegadon was promised by biden so the only way that one can stop bad behavior from even a superpower is of course by deterrence and that unfortunately is an argument against disarmament but the fact is that had we called out this bad behavior from the time nato uh, you know exercised its uh, uh, policy i think we wouldn't have come to this day where we would have to threaten a tactical nuclear weapon with a nuclear submarine so um, my view is that the goal to disarmament the road to disarmament is long and hard but the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step thank you uh, i want to ask you uh, well you know this is what i was going to ask you whether we have time so the floor is open for questions but i uh, am a very bad chairman i'd like to limit uh, your questions to just 1 minute and uh, uh, no comments please okay professor mahapatra i just wanted to give you a footnote to what you said sir very very important point you said that it is extremely relevant to discuss the consequences of the nuclear war so just one footnote very important b83 it is the most powerful bomb that the us had joe biden administration had just withdrawn it the new york, new york times beautifully says what does it mean withdrawing the thing they are not going to destroy it it is only dismantling it all the parts will be there whenever it is necessary they can always assemble it so complete nuclear disarmament is not possible thank you any more comments questions please question to you and mr sharma uh, see the fact is that uh, the Mike, nuclear Mike. arms sorry where is that which the fact is that the nuclear arms <laughs> cannot be done away with they exist and they will remain and uh, the nuclear terrorism as very uh, nicely uh, argued by uh, air marshal rajesh kumar that the russia is showing a sort of uh, nuclear ter terrorism we can say and then most importantly we have also seen with the uh, russia uh, russia ukraine conflict that the entire world is being divided into a binary kind of a system wherein either you are with me or you are against me and uh, this has put uh, countries like india a uh, very big challenge to remain neutral 
so do you think that under such circumstances the authoritarian regimes like that of putin or let's say north korea they are a threat to the nuclear uh, disarmament well you know the uh, authoritarian regimes uh, are blamed for it and uh, i'm clubbing russia with north korea is a bit difficult uh, to swallow but north korea has been very unrestrained in giving threats and we find it of late uh, that even china and russia have been using that kind of a language but when you had trump in the us he also used that language so it is very difficult to distinguish between who is authoritarian and who is uh, autocratic but india keeps away from this these are the kind of uh, you know differences among the great powers uh, our point is and which our government has said repeatedly that uh, you know you fought you created a bad situation for us we have crisis of food fuel and fertilizers what about that and as for the war where wars have happened in in south also in iraq war with the, uh, the in yemen so you don't worry about it so there's a war in europe and you want us to be you know ex- extremely worried and take sides and things of that sort so that this produces its own non alignment and detachment and from there you know from what you mentioned the question comes is that who is to decide who is wrong and right the un system is completely uh, you know in no position our they are in a way impliedly undermining the un authority they have undermined they have actually paralyzed the un system completely so that is what we are seeing now yep uh thank you very very much ambassador for your sharing and your comments and to the panel as well uh, i think perhaps this is one of the few panels in which we have women speaking about verification systems risk reduction hopefully this participation in this because it was always seen as an area where only defense personnel spoke earlier and of course nuclear experts like you uh so this is a, in some senses uh it's both uh, it's 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 a very welcome uh shall i say change but at the same time how are we reframing the issue will remain crucial and that we don't really buy in to a discourse that propels us only into deterrence vocabularies so thank you very very much indeed and i it can also I, can i also just express my yes, thanks to yes, you oh please and oh. which compliments to to this comp and you for organizing this thank, thank you, you. No, it's really iic mantri swiss comp it's been a partnership a collaborative security <laughs> i not comprehensive <laughs> i i i I, say, i just take great pleasure at this moment just for a brief moment to uh, to introduce you to a new book called deep state continuum in pakistan and implications for india and uh, and i uh, it's just come out and the author is present here jyoti pa- jyoti pathania <laughs> please come and take a bow and like we w- you were talking about the uh, the significant outsider right in, in earlier when we were talking about india's uh, particular stand and uh, uh, i want to say that she has coined a term here called uniformed democracy now d- a paradoxical term but anyway she she talked about a uniformed democracy when it comes to pakistan so please give her a big hand and please buy the book in large numbers it's a matter of great pride for us that she's Thank come you. out with this book so when your book comes out we are going to have yet another uh, a, a great celebration